My name is Carolyn Niccolo. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, I'm a mathematics and physics teacher at Cobequid Educational Center in Truro. So I'm part of Shignectro Central Center for Education. Uh, and before I go much further, I'd also like to acknowledge that I live and teach in Mi'kma'ki, our ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. My Indigenous learners have helped me to better understand different ways of knowing, which has shaped how I offer a flipped classroom or a blended learning experience. And especially for me, approaching a lesson or a workshop as a story to be told, entering into our sharing through story ways of knowing, that really resonates with me. It's a significant part of my teaching style. So I feel the storytelling coming out as I'm designing a flipped lesson or as I'm preparing to present to some colleagues from my kitchen table. So this morning, our agenda is gonna be a little bit fluid, uh, but my intention is to use that menti poll again in a few moments to check in with what knowledge and questions about flipped learning we bring with us. I'm gonna share a little bit of theory about flipped classrooms and history with you through a slightly different platform called Prezi. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my process, and then we're gonna move in to talk about the e-learning crisis teaching experience some examples of what I did and some lessons that I learned before uh, designed part of Q&A. But certainly if you have questions before I get to them, please feel free to enter them in chat and Stephanie is gonna help out as our moderator with that this morning. I also wanted to acknowledge that I'm choosing to exclusively use Menti today because it's very easy for me to share those polls without needing to share a link. Uh, so it's really simple when we're just doing screen sharing. If it's a tool that you'd like to use as a teacher, www.mentimeter.com is the site that I've used to create my account and create those polls. Uh, I'm not sure about approval for different RCEs, so that's something that you'd have to look into, but it is a very friendly option, and there are some other friendly options as well. If at any point in time you're interested in information that I'm sharing throughout the workshop, please feel free to contact me and let me know that you'd like some more of that information, and I'm going to very happily share uh, viewing rights to my slide deck with everyone who contacts me, so that means that you'd get access to all of these links as well. So with that, we're going to check in with what knowledge and questions we bring with us. So the same process as last time. If you're using a mobile device, we can use the QR code on screen to access the poll. Or we're going to go back to that different tab or window, going to menti.com and enter a new code that I'm going to share on screen for this poll. So our first question, prior to March 2020, did you know what a flipped classroom is? And looking at our responses, so we've got roughly two thirds of our participants, assuming that those who haven't had a chance to enter their responses in Menti yet have had a similar experience. Uh, looking at roughly two thirds of our participants who didn't know what a flipped classroom is, and that kind of fits what I expected based on our content knowledge, because this is something that is more commonly discussed from a mathematics perspective than other perspectives, but certainly valuable for all of us. My next question for us this morning, did you learn anything about flipped classrooms during crisis teaching? All right, so we're seeing some really similar results here and it would be sort of interesting to be able to clarify, are those results paralleling what we saw with people who knew about flipped classrooms before uh, March 2020. But I'm actually going to tell you folks, all of us learned something about flipped classrooms during our crisis teaching or our e-learning. We may just not have known that that label applied. So one last question again to help guide me as we're going through. And again, I do want to offer respect and honor the fact that not everyone has been able to give input right now through this poll. I know that must be really frustrating. Just trying to also make sure that I'm keeping an eye on the clock so we get the chance to get as much of our information as perspective as possible. So our final question for now, what are you hoping to learn during this workshop? Um, Carolyn, while we're waiting for some responses there, we do have a question. Sure thing. Um, can the teacher see which specific students answered through Menti and what they oh. answered? 
Excellent. No, it's completely anonymous. Um, oh. So if I wanted to see a specific student's response, I'd use one of the other tools. Sometimes I found in my own teaching practice that students like the anonymity and we tend to get better results through that. Um, but Menti does not allow us to match who said which. It does allow us some really nice tools as a teacher, for example, a profanity filter, um, so that we can make sure we're getting appropriate responses that way. Okay. And the other question is, can you save your results for reflection later? Yes. So I will have all of these results uh, in my account through Mentimeter. And in fact, before I share this slide deck with uh, our participants who ask for rights, I'm going to grab some images because they're completely anonymous. That way we don't have to worry about people's privacy. Um, grab some images of the poll results to share in that slide deck for participants who want to reflect back on it later. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, no problem. I appreciate the help, Stephanie moderator. All right, so I can see from our responses so far, we're looking at some strategies, we're looking at some management ideas um, and trying to figure out really how to put this all together. And I think that's something that all of us have struggled with. So as was mentioned earlier, those are my spaces to enter. Um, I've been offering calculus as a flipped course for four years now. I've actually been offering flipped classes for five years, ever since I came back from maternity leave. Flipped classroom is actually something that I first heard about during my BED program uh, in the early 2000s when I was in my mathematics method courses, but it didn't make sense to me how I could make it work. While I was on maternity leave and technology had evolved and I had a little bit more time to think about my teaching practice, that's when I really came to the idea of the flipped classroom. So let's talk for a moment about what a flipped classroom is. With two definitions, when we talk about a flipped classroom, a flipped classroom is literally where the teacher flips when and where lessons happen and when and where practice happens. So at its most basic level, a flipped classroom is when content is delivered outside of class time and then class time is focused on practice. So the delivery of the content might be a textbook reading. It might be photocopied notes if we're face-to-face. -face. It might be a website or a blog or a video. One of the things that I struggled with a lot with the idea of flipped classrooms in the beginning was feeling that it always had to be videos. And a lot of my students are very rural. They didn't have great internet when I was starting this process out. Many of us still don't have great internet. And so that was something that I really needed to work through and understand what my options were to come to our idea of what a flipped classroom is and looks like. Now, there is a short YouTube video that does a really nice job explaining this. Uh, unfortunately, one of our issues with technology, uh, this morning it's not possible for me to share the video with adequate sound. But again, if anyone's interested, I'm certainly sharing all of this content. And if you wanted to go back and talk to your own staffs about this or share with your teaching team, uh, we certainly could. One of the things I like about this video is how it really has some great visuals summarizing a classroom where one of our students completely gets the idea, one of our students doesn't get the idea, one of the students finds it much too easy. So in our flipped classroom model, where we're changing when is the content presented and when does the practice happen, the flipped classroom, our content is delivered at home, and now our students are doing the practice in class, and one of the benefits of that content being delivered at home is that the students get to work through it at their own pace. So when we talk about the history of flipped classroom, the idea has been around since the 1990s. It was first used in college and university courses, specifically in calculus courses, to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer discussion and instruction. And it was promoted as a way to avoid sage on the stage teaching. The original university professors and education researchers who started this idea 
we're trying to have students take more responsibility for their own learning, which is, I think, something that we can all relate to and all hope to see in our own classrooms. There's a lot of research into flipped classrooms. Uh, I won't dig into it very much right now, again, honoring our time and wanting to make sure that we leave time for questions before our keynote speaker at the end. But three things to highlight from the research, and this is consistent across a broad body of research. Outside of crisis scenarios, flipped learning is associated with better attendance and engagement. It's associated with more efficient use of class time and students report lower stress levels in flipped classroom scenarios. And that's something that I've really noticed using a flipped classroom with calculus. The change in their stress levels is dramatic. So we compare that with blended learning, which is a phrase we've heard a lot about right now in terms of what the 2020-2021 school year might look like. Blended learning outside of the COVID context means that it's a blend of a flipped classroom and traditional teaching. Often introductory concepts would be introduced as a flipped lesson and then more depth added in the classroom once the students have those introductory concepts down. So some of the benefits associated with our flipped classroom. It allows for a much more differentiated experience when a student is struggling. When we have a student who has some processing differences so that taking notes for them in a traditional lecture setting is really challenging, for example, a flipped classroom allows them to work at their own space. A lot of my students tell me how much they love being able to look at part of the video and then hit pause and write down as much as they need to, rewind if they want to, listen to something again. And other students who find the concept very easy may skim through the video until they see something on screen that doesn't make sense to them. Uh, students, for me as well as in the research, report attempting at least twice as much practice associated with flipped learning as in a traditional scenario. So for those of us who are teaching chemistry, we know that there are a lot of types of problems that require practice. Doubling that amount of practice times means that our students are much more likely to be successful. Uh, flipped classrooms also allow us to have some richer discussions. So for our ELA and our French teachers, if your students are getting some content and note taking done outside of class, certainly that's going to benefit them in their speaking and listening when they have more time for that in class. Uh, as a teacher, flip classrooms will leave you a lot more time to better your relationships with your students. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention flipped classrooms make for very simple sub planning when the content delivery is already supposed to happen outside of class. If your child is suddenly ill, if you wake up with the flu, certainly they make planning for a sub a lot friendlier. I also do need to mention some of the challenges. Flip classrooms do rely on student motivation and maturity. So the first year that I started to offer a flipped classroom, uh, I worked with students in Math 10 as well as students in Math 12. And I very quickly found that my students in Math 10 were struggling with the concept uh, because they weren't used to the work at home being so necessary. Also because a flipped classroom does presume a certain degree of student privilege and tech access which is a concept that we're all very familiar with now after the spring and this idea of techquity that we're going to hear more about at 1030. As a teacher, the front end setup is time consuming and we have experienced, I think, any of us who've tried flipped classrooms before e-learning and now as we're hearing and reading discussion about coming back to school in September, Traditional classroom teaching is very valued, and I've personally experienced some pushback from students who are expecting that traditional classroom experience. Um, another challenge is the design of the flipped lesson because it's a little bit of a change from where we might have originally been thinking. So we keep in mind that a flipped lesson is designed to replace a traditional lecture. It's not going to replace a hands-on activity. It's not going to replace a discussion-based activity. But if there's a simple delivery of content, if I needed to talk about uh, verb structure in a certain language, if I needed to talk about 
how to balance an equation in a chemistry class. If I needed to give some vocabulary to students in my physics class, those would all really suit a flipped lesson. The rule of thumb from about three years ago and back was that there was supposed to be about one minute of lesson per grade level. So that for my grade 10s, the maximum amount of time that I should design the lesson to be is 10 minutes, knowing that some of those students may take twice as long because of how they're approaching the lesson. My experience since then is that five minutes seems to be ideal even for my high school students. When you're designing a flipped lesson, you do need to plan for how the students are going to take notes at their own pace, plan for some self-assessment of their understanding, and plan for some discussion to happen. Uh, in e-learning, that looks different certainly than in the classroom, but we want to include that discussion piece because it's what helps improve the student memory, their retention, their application of the skills. Prior to COVID, um, I've talked about flipped classrooms in a couple of scenarios, and this was always like the grand finale of my presentations previously, is that it's been my experience there is a beautiful, rich, hidden curriculum with flipped classrooms. Students learn an incredible amount of content. In calculus, I was able to not only go through everything in the high school calculus curriculum, we could parallel some of what was happening in higher level IB mathematics and sneak in things that former students of mine were saying, gosh, I wish I'd really seen this in high school. So we covered a huge amount of content and students were really successful. But at the same time, they also learned how to take notes. And it wasn't simply create their own copy of the notes that I'm putting on the whiteboard. They were taking personalized notes. They learned how to develop study strategies other than pure memorization. And I don't know content areas outside of mathematics, physics, and to a certain extent, chemistry, because my husband is a chemistry teacher. But in those three content areas, gosh, we see a lot of students who just rely on memorization. Flipped classrooms really help deal with that because they're developing some other study strategies. Students start to learn warning signs that they need help, and they're much more likely to ask for help because of how the classroom time is used. They learn how to seek out alternate explorations and explanations if they're stuck. And one of the things that I think is most beautiful is that students really start to take ownership of and see diversity in productive academic habits. So what works for me isn't necessarily going to work for Jill or for Ron or for Garrett. And gosh, what works for them isn't necessarily going to work for me. And it becomes a really nice thing for students to start to understand a little bit more about themselves as learners and their own learning styles. So out of this, uh, students learn how to be resilient and persistent. They learn how to persevere or in the language of the NCTM, they learn how to experience productive struggle, which also means that there's an incredibly meaningful impact on levels of anxiety and mental health. In a flipped classroom, we start normalizing feeling challenged or overwhelmed or uncertain, and it becomes a lot more reasonable for our students to start to push past that. And that's one of the things that I think is the most beautiful and the most brilliant piece of it. So now that we've heard a little bit of the theory behind flipped classrooms, um, I'm gonna start to talk a little bit more about how I put this theory into practice prior to March, 2020. For me personally, and this does look different for different teachers, for me personally, I cho did choose to make videos of my lessons. I used the explain everything education version of that app on my iPad, but there are an incredible number of options for making videos. Uh, ahead of time, I would choose the practice for each lesson and I would work out really detailed solutions. So in math and physics, the students see a lot of mathematical type problems and being able to see line by line what the solution looks like is helpful. Again, in a French classroom, in a social studies classroom, in a food sciences classroom, what the practice and the follow up to that, the reflection on that looks like would vary. The other thing that I do ahead of time is choose a tentative pace for my unit. And I create a calendar for the students showing where they ought to be done particular lessons. So we're going to spend two days on this particular topic, and then we're going to spend two days on this particular topic, and so on. And I'll also show them what the practice is going to be. And I hand all of that out ahead of the start of the unit 
so that they've got a really good idea where we are going. In terms of my expectations for them, students are expected to watch the lessons by the given deadline and take notes on the lesson. For students who are having trouble with internet access, I would provide the lessons to them on a flash drive. We'll make sure to connect them with our resource center, with the library, with a space where we can make that happen so that they're able to take those notes. They're then expected to complete a formative assessment to check their understanding ahead of that deadline. So really, they should be coming to class with an idea of how well they understood the material, and they're expected to bring notes to class to refer to as they need. So once we get to class, they work on the practice and they ask for support as needed. That support might be from me, it might be from their peers, and this means that the experience is generally very collaborative. Students spend a really significant amount of time in discussion with each other, and that's what allows for a deeper, richer understanding and starting to understand different perspectives because they start explaining things to each other. And as we know, when you're explaining something to someone else, when you're teaching someone else, you internalize those ideas much better and develop a much richer understanding. So some students will end up ahead or behind based on their own situations. Perhaps I have a student who knows that they're going to be traveling with their family next week, so they're trying to work ahead. Perhaps I have a student who was ill and they missed a few days of class and they were too sick to work. But generally, it's very rare for students to be completely out of sync. Um, a few will come to class each year trying to do the problems without having done the lesson. But this very rarely persists because they start to feel not an intentional, but a subtle peer pressure of, oh, you didn't know that? Well, it was in the lesson. And all of a sudden, there is this reinforcing idea about doing that work at home that I just don't see when they do the lessons and the content in class and the practice is supposed to happen outside of class. Some of our important components for the flipped classroom we do need to have a clear plan. We need to have a clear understanding and a communication of our curriculum expectations and our behavior expectations. We need student motivation and accountability, which is really where a lot of that self-assessment comes in. And that's why we need to plan for multiple opportunities and methods for students to self-assess. Another important component that I never really realized until after probably the third test I had done in a fully flipped calculus classroom, it allows for an incredibly intensive self-directed review. We'll get students who will go back and rewatch every single lesson for the entire unit, and they love it preparing for tests. But for me as a classroom teacher, what I appreciate the most is the increased interactions in small groups or one-on-one -on -one situations. My relationships with my students in flipped classrooms are so much deeper and richer than they are in any other context. So I guess the short version is I was absolutely in love with my flipped classroom. And then March happened. Uh, my dog was chewing on my laptop cord. My daughter was home because daycare wasn't available. There are two of us trying to teach. It was a really high stress scenario for all of us. So doing another check in, I feel really awkward speaking essentially to my laptop. Uh, and not being able to hear the voices of participants, and that's always really important to me. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about how you delivered content during e-learning or crisis education, whichever of those terms better suits you. So again, we can use the QR code on screen or go to menti.com, and I'm going to open up that third poll. This time, there's a single question here. And Carolyn, we have another question. Do you make your own videos? Ah, excellent. Um, I have in the past. During the spring, I learned to let go. Um, and it's certainly something. My family jokes that I'm a border collie personality. I, I very focused, very perfectionist, but I also like to get enough sleep and I love to spend time with my family. Uh, so I'm learning to reach out and collaborate with other people. I'm learning to find great videos. Uh, and that's something that I'm going to be taking advantage of moving forward. 
but it's a lesson that I am certainly taking away from my experience in the spring is that it's okay to not make everything myself. So noticing here, we have colleagues who've used Google Classroom, a hyperdoc. This is actually something I didn't realize that a hyperdoc was a thing until uh, after I had submitted report card marks and I was starting to reflect on what I had done, what can I do better, um, and getting really interested in learning about hyperdocs. Uh, in fact, uh, I had originally set up this slide deck, very keen and excited as a hyperdoc until I realized that when I present my screen, my colleagues can't necessarily click on links. Um, oh, wow, so we've got some incredible ideas here. All right, so my experience. Um, I want to, first of all, be completely honest. When I knew that we were going to be moving into distance learning, I started out feeling really confident because I knew that I was really good as a flipped classroom teacher. But I had three different courses. Only one of them was flipped. And trying to deliver content for all of my classes when students were in different situations, when so much was going on, it felt really high pressure to me. It felt like a lot of triage. And I. It was one of the darkest times of my career. It was a huge low point for me. But this is where I'm taking it as a learning experience, trying to do better myself. So for me, the process of getting this workshop together certainly is allowing me to think about how I can improve for next time. So for me in the spring, for my students who are already doing flipped learning in calculus, not much changed. And in fact, an incredible number of my students reached out within the first two weeks saying, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we were doing calculus as a flipped class because I'm not worried about this. This is my lowest stress piece. I know that I can do this. So we covered less content and the process of checking in and getting answers to questions was much trickier. Uh, in all honesty, I ended up giving students multiple ways to contact me. I was getting tweets, I was getting um, text messages, emails, whatever they felt comfortable with so that I could answer their questions as soon as possible. Uh, my IB physics class moved to a very similar model. I posted videos of my lessons. I posted the slideshows, gave them practice problems, gave them work solutions, and tried to check in as much as possible. Where things got interesting for me was the third course, Math 10. Uh, at my site, there are five Math 10 teachers, or I should say were last year, uh, and we collaborated with two Math 10 teachers from another school in our region. Um, so the process that we came up with was to create websites as resource depots where students could find their learning targets, their context resources, their practice problems, whatever it was that they were interested in. We had some optional extras. And then each individual teacher would post the link to that week's resource depot in their Google Classroom. So we could still have some personal interactions with the kids digitally, but nobody had to do all of it. So again, for people who are interested, this is added as a link to the slideshow. So we would show students uh, in the week that we were exploring slope, the learning targets for the week. We gave them the breakdown of timeline, so roughly three hours of work all together. Here's a link to your digital math textbook. Here's a link to a digital graph and calculator. Uh, for students who teach mathematics in high, or pardon me, staff who teach mathematics in high school, you may be familiar with Homework Hub. Uh, that was an excellent resource for students. And then we would give them, here's an image. Here is a video. Here is a website that all relates to the learning target. And then repeat that process. And what I found to be really beautiful and helpful with this was that it was very, very freeing to be so collaborative. My job was to actually take everything everyone else shared with me and build the site. There were other teachers who were finding and vetting the videos so that we had great videos. There were other teachers who were creating assessments for all of us to use. And the biggest part for me was that we reached out to another school. And that's certainly a lesson that I'm taking away. Sometimes in particular, um, I'm one of only two physics teachers at my school. I was the only one teaching the first year of the IB physics program. It, it's very easy to feel like you're the only one 
who can do something, the only one who can make the videos, but there certainly are a lot of amazing people in the province that we can collaborate with. So what did I learn about flipped classrooms during crisis education? Uh, stealing a quote from our union president, the idea that perfectionism is the enemy of good. And I touched on this earlier. I learned that I don't have to make everything myself. Uh, I learned that I need to go bite size. Students really appreciated content in small doses, even if it meant more bites for them. Um, in some cases, I think this had to do with the idea that so many of us were using internet. No matter how fantastic our home internet was, we all experienced lags and drops. So a shorter little bit of content to get through was easier for students, but also it allowed them to pause and process and digest. When I stop and think about how flipping gave me a chance to deepen relationships, I learned that when I'm working at a distance, I need to continue to nurture that by giving students a chance to see me somehow. And again, this was a challenge for us. I've got a very active child who was home with us. She always wanted to be waving at the camera, involved. I'm still wrapping my head around what synchronous distance learning might look like for my home if there is a shutdown in my family of schools. But it was really important that I reached out to those students, even if it was just sending a picture, making sure that my face appeared in a video, having a meeting. Um, I learned that I'm not worried about being replaced by a computer or AI. And this actually goes back to one of the first times I talked about flipped learning at the Atlantic Calculus Conference. There was an older colleague there who said, well, yeah, that's great, but aren't you worried? No, after this experience where we were all distanced, I am not at all concerned that flipped learning means that I'm replaceable. I did learn that I need to reconsider how I handle deadlines and returning work. In a true flipped classroom where I get to work with my students every day physically in class, that was pretty straightforward, but at a distance, especially where so many people did feel emotionally in crisis, I saw my students spreading out. Sometimes students would actually be working on week four when we're on week four, and some students were still back in week two because that's the pace that they could work at. So that's something I'm gonna need to consider. But the biggest takeaway for me, and the most important thing for me to share with my colleagues who are considering flipped learning and what we might do next year, students really need the chance to discuss the content with their peers, and especially they need to experience how others struggle. We all know that a lot of our students, no matter how confident they come across, students are always concerned that their experience is unique. They're the only one who feels this way. They're the only one who struggles. They're the one who's hard on themselves. And it's really important for them to have that opportunity to recognize that everyone else is in sort of a similar scenario. So what I'm taking away from this, I am gonna move another course to a flipped classroom model for September. I do worry about Tequity, and I worry that I'm not going to do a good job taking my two other existing courses to a flipped classroom model at once, but I am spending time this summer so that I have a second course set up flipped classroom just in case, but also because, gosh, I really love this experience and it's a lot of work, but I think it's worth it. As I touched on earlier, I'm definitely going to stop trying to make everything myself because there are so many fantastic resources out there and it's just as easy to add a short bit of commentary when I post a link about, eh, I might use this phrase instead of that phrase rather than spending five hours trying to do it on my own. This summer, I am intentionally curating a collection of digital resources. So I've got some of those shared at the end of my slideshow for people who ask for that one, but mostly trying to think about, oh, this would be great to use for, I'm gonna save that link. I'm definitely gonna be planning in-person routines and norms to mesh with what's gonna happen online. So even when we're in person, I might be using a Menti poll or a Padlet to do some check-ins. I might be using some digital tools, maintaining a Bitmoji classroom for my agenda, just so that if there is a sudden switch, things still feel similar for my classes. And certainly, I'm going to be exploring ways to facilitate some asynchronous discussions among my students about challenging concepts, because I really did take away that they need that piece. That's what my calculus students missed most. When we reflected at the end of the course, they missed talking with each other. And I really thought that they would be texting each other, Snapchatting what's going on. I would see it happening in class, 
but they felt so alone and isolated and without seeing one another's body language of, oh, Carolyn is struggling too, they weren't actually all that likely to reach out to each other. I am going to have to actively teach my students how to interact with the tools that I would use in a digital classroom. So for my Math 10 students, we tend to use Google Slides for assignment a lot. I'm going to make sure I teach them how to insert pictures. How do we make sure that we can attach and submit an assignment digitally? That's something that some of my students had trouble with and I didn't expect. I'm going to have to have conversations with my course teams about deadlines and returning work. We know that it's harmful to students to wait too long to give them feedback, but we don't want to release answer keys to the math assignment before everyone had a chance to do it. That's something that we're going to have to navigate this fall. And certainly trying to learn more about methods of authentic online assessment. Uh, the number of students who admitted to me after grades came out, oh yeah, well, five of us just did that calculus assignment together. I'm working on changing my questioning style, but mostly, I do also have to be mindful of how my students feel about digital work. I mentioned that I'm in Truro. We're about 40 kilometers away from port peak We had a three-year-old child go missing this spring as well on top of the shutdown. So our community has experienced significant multiple traumas and digital work might be bringing that back for my students. In September, even more than usual, I'm going to have to be aware that I'm going to have to adapt to suit the needs of my class. So those are sort of my takeaways. As we're coming to the end of the workshop, I want to make sure, and Stephanie's done such a beautiful job facilitating this, but checking in, what questions do you still have about flipped classrooms that I might be able to help you with or to answer? My personal favorite tools to use um, uh, in terms of actual physical tools. Uh, I use an iPad with an Apple Pencil um, and I use that together with the app that I mentioned called Explain Everything which allows me to create video lessons. It allows me to record my voice and my writing and it's very very friendly, uh, very intuitive to use. Uh, once I have those videos made, I'll post them to Google Classroom and my favorite tool to use for a formative assessment is Google Forms. So using a lot of the tools that are already part of the Google Apps for Education suite and bringing in a little bit of hardware along with an app that allows creating videos. At a younger grade level, colleagues of mine have told me that Flipgrid is actually a really nice video tool to use for making lessons. So it just kind of depends on what age level you're interested in and as well what you're comfortable with. So for example, I have colleagues who use Screencastify to make videos. The latest version of PowerPoint allows you to record a video. PowerPoint and Prezi both allow you to record videos with a small window in window that has your face so students can see you. There are lots of different tools that we can use. Uh, moving on to our next question, how much time per lesson do I spend preparing a flipped lesson? From very beginning to end, it probably takes me for a course like calculus or physics that's very technical, probably about five hours. For a course like Math 10, where each piece is going to be slightly smaller um, and there aren't as many necessary variations that I would deal with in a single video, that might take something like two hours. It depends on what we're doing and again, it also depends on how perfectionist you are. For me, if my dog barks in the background, I'm gonna go back and re-record over that, um, but it just depends on the situation. I see a colleague who's talked about wanting to see an example of a lesson flipped. We're certainly gonna share that. Uh, oh, this is a great question. Do I use the materials for a flipped course year after year? Absolutely. So it took me a lot of time and effort to prepare flipped calculus. But now there's very little that needs to be changed year to year. I co-taught it this year with another teacher at my school. And uh, she's a mother with two young children coming back just after mat leave. And I just said, 
remake any of the videos with your own voice that you like, but here you go. Here's my whole library. This is the calendar I'm using, the practice I'm using. Go for it. And it made the experience for her really straightforward because everything is prepared. That's one of the other payoffs of a flipped classroom. It takes a lot of time to create, but once it's made, there's only the investment of time for polishing. Um, so that's a huge benefit. Once it's set up, we can continue to use it year after year just with those obvious modifications. Uh, again, someone who'd like to see a lesson and some practice, happy to show that one. Uh, interventions we would provide to students who have low learning autonomy. Uh, this one certainly is something that I still struggle with a little bit. Uh, the interventions might be something like if they're a high school student who has an academic support block scheduled in, then I'm going to coordinate with their resource center team and their academic support teacher to check in there. Because a lot of their self-assessment is through Google Forms and Google Classroom, I get a pretty quick idea of who hasn't been doing the work. And one of the benefits, because the students are able to help each other. Remember, flipped classrooms were developed to facilitate the idea of the, as, of the teacher as a guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. It gives me a lot more time to work one-on-one -on -one with students. So one of my primary interventions is going to be that they'll be someone that I'm going to check in with eight or ten times a class period rather than three or four times a class period. It might be something like touching base with their parents and mentioning, oh, hey, I noticed that Garrett is having trouble with this. Have you seen him watch the lessons at home? Did you know that this was something that was happening? Um, if you can maybe pop me an email and let me know what specific troubles there are. Those are some of the interventions that I would use. But again, it depends on the student. Uh, oh, definitely, I think all of us have trouble at first with flipped classrooms. I love this observation because it's very true for all of us. Um, can we use flipped classroom for summative assessment? I think I understand what this questioner is asking. Um, the flipped classroom itself is for delivering content. So the definition of that flipped classroom is the idea that we are exchanging when is content delivered and where is practice happening. The idea really is that students are working on practice with an expert in the room with them able to intervene as soon as there's difficulty. So it's a content delivery strategy rather than an assessment strategy. But flipped classrooms certainly relate to summative assessments again, because whether it's a series of readings, websites, blogs, videos, hyperdocs, the students have that chance to go back and review all of the content at their own pace. So we do see a payoff on summative assessments. When I made the change from a traditional delivery of calculus to a flipped classroom model, in my professional opinion, keeping everything the same in terms of difficulty level, the class average jumped by about 10 points. And that includes our final exam. Ah, love this question. This was something that I struggled with a lot in the spring. How do I accommodate for students with low or no access to internet or tech? The answer to this one is a little bit different uh, during crisis teaching than it was outside of our experience in the spring. Outside of the experience in the spring, it involves starting with a conversation with the student, finding a little bit more about, okay, where do you spend your lunch? Are you already going to the library? Okay, well, let me show you where you can access a computer that we're gonna set aside for you. For students in grade 11 and 12, do you have a free period? You're welcome to come to my classroom, sit in the back of the classroom, use this Chromebook and these headphones, and go for it that way, checking to see if they have a resource block. Sometimes for students, they have a basic device at home, but not a reliable internet. So we'd make sure that we'd give them the library of videos burned onto a CD, loaded onto a flash drive, uploaded onto a cell phone on the school Wi-Fi, some way that they'd be able to access it that way. Um, and in my experience, that has pretty much always worked. I can think of a single case in five years where I had a student where none of those options worked. 
Um, and then that required working with the student and giving them paper copies of notes uh, and getting a digital recorder and recording the voiceover that goes with the notes so they could take it home and listen to that. Um, where do I find videos that I didn't create myself? Excellent question. I mostly use videos found on YouTube. For mathematics, I'll tend to lean into Khan Academy or for grade 10 math using videos created for the homework hub. For physics, especially where I'm in the International Baccalaureate or IB program, using videos that have been created specifically for those. There's some great content producers who have entire YouTube channels dedicated to that program. Um, but mostly using videos that I'm finding on YouTube, yes. All right, so I think I've managed to address most of those questions. Uh, I am going to take some time for those who would like to stick around to open up my drive and show an example of a video, but we have reached the end of our scheduled hour and I don't want to make anyone feel obligated or uh, guilted into sticking around. So I wanted to thank you so much for your energy, your input today. There's some really thoughtful questions. Please don't hesitate to contact me for viewing rights to this slideshow. I firmly believe that we all do better when we are sharing. Uh, so my contact information is on screen. I do have a final slide set up with some resources that you might find helpful for anybody who wanted the viewing rights to that slideshow and was interested in a few more resources.